This podcast is brought to you by AJ Bell and Shares Magazine. Shares Magazine is published by AJ Bell Media, part of AJ Bell. Hi, and welcome to this week's Money and Markets podcast. I'm Charlene Young, and this week I'm joined by Dan Coatsworth. There's been a testing time for investors as events in the Middle East and a spate of economic data have pushed and pulled markets in different directions. So we'll be diving into the details to make sense of what's going on. Now, we'll also talk about the rise of scams, including more than £1 million lost by Taylor Swift fans being duped into buying fake concert tickets. Later on, we'll run through the first findings from the FCA in the public inquiry into Neil Woodford and the events leading up to the collapse of his equity income fund. And in this week's interview, Danny Houston chats to Ashoka India Equity Trust about where they see the investment opportunity and what is expected to be the G20's fastest growing economy this year. Now, I've got a bit of upbeat news on UK IPOs and also uh, finish on a feel good note. Charlene's going to run through gift aid rules where you donate money to UK charities and how you can claim tax relief and possibly even dodge one of the many traps in the UK system. So let's start off by looking at the markets. Uh, Dan, we've had inflation figures today that indicate it's cooling. Uh, listeners, we're recording on Wednesday afternoon here. Um, what else has been going on as well? Well, it's been a pretty testing time, the markets. They've been rocked by various different jobs figures. We've had the Middle East tension just last weekend as well. So um, obviously, this is the, the latter has really rattled investors. I think the, the idea that geopolitical risk mixed with inflation fears is definitely not good for markets. Uh, we've seen gold price strengthening. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of things to unpick here. So I think that if we start with the, the, the Middle East stuff, so we had um, sort of escalated tensions last weekend. I think people were expecting the oil price to surge on this because the, the idea that you know if, if there's more troubles in the Middle East, how will that impact oil supplies? But actually what we, we saw was oil prices actually fell on Monday. Um, and I think this is just a case of that, People kind of got a sense this escalated violence was going to happen. Price had always risen in the in expectation of, of these actions. Um, and Brent crude was near a six-month high last week. But I, I think it's really important to keep a watchful eye on what's happening in the Middle East because um, if there is more widespread conflict, it's fair to say that energy prices could get another leg upwards. And, of course, the high oil price that we have seen in recent weeks anyway – is troublesome because it could keep inflation high. So um, lots of people have been looking at sort of central bank uh, interest rate cut expectations. And you know, some are even suggesting now that we're not going to get a single cut from the US. So um, so that kind of brings us to, the, to what's been happening in the UK. So we've had a rise in unemployment figures, but wage growth has been hotter than expected. So um, that makes life really hard for the Bank of England to try and work out exactly what's going on. Inflation has fallen to 3.2%. So obviously, that's what they want to see. They want to see inflation falling, but they also want to see um, signs that perhaps you know the, the employment market is not too hot. And at the moment, it seems like the employment market's holding up. So um, higher wage growth that we've seen, it, it kind of implies that people have got a bit more money in their pockets. If they spend more, will that fuel inflation? So we, we, we've got lots of things going on here. So I think it's really, really difficult to call when the Bank of England will cut rates. And so the latest things I've, I'm sort of reading about is that previously we were thinking maybe they're going to start cutting in June. Now we're looking at potentially in August. So I think investors need to understand that um, it's getting kicked further down the road here in terms of when we see these cuts. Because the market wants cuts. Uh, it will relieve some of the financial pressures on, on businesses and on consumers. And you know, theoretically, that should be good for the stock market. But at the moment, um, these expectations are getting further down the line. So it, it is a very sort of tricky situation, very hard to understand what's going on. Some people might think, OK, I'm just going to ignore the noise and get on with what I've been doing all along, perhaps just uh, investing a little bit of money in the markets every month, not trying to time markets. Um I think that you know that there's a lot of sense in trying to um, not get sort of too confused about the noise, but equally, it's really important to keep an eye on what's happening with these figures because things keep changing on a daily basis. I wanted to include 
a bit in this sort of news section just about what's going on with the Woodford Equity Fund because there has been a bit another update about that product and obviously lots of people were affected by the collapse of this investment product. So Charlene, what, what's what's the latest news on the Woodford stuff? Yeah, yeah. So we've had an update last week and it's the first findings from the FCA review into kind of just what went wrong there. So just as a quick reminder, the parties under investigation are Neil Woodford himself, um, his firm Woodford Investment Management and the administrator Link Fund Solutions, who were supposed to properly manage the fund to protect investors' interests. Now, these findings actions really sort of focus on Link. Um, So as we know, the fund was thrown into turmoil back in 2019 um, as investors tried to cash out faster than Mr. Woodford could sell the assets to raise the cash to pay them back. So much of the money that investors had put into the fund was in illiquid assets. So when they wanted their money back, the fund struggled to get that cash together to pay them. And it later suspended withdrawals to kind of give it some breathing space. So the FCA has found that between the end of July 2018 and the suspension of the fund on June the 3rd, 19, um, Link, that administrator, failed to manage the liquidity of the fund, making it difficult for investors to access their money at short notice. Now, the FCA has also said that Link had failed to properly oversee Woodford Investment Management or to sufficiently ensure that worries about liquidity at the time were addressed. So for these failings, the FCA said it would have fined Link £50 million, but it's decided not to, as that would actually leave less money to give back to those investors who are out of pocket. Um, Since the funds collapse, uh, Link has been selling off assets and has returned money to investors. Um, It's also reached an agreement which will see um, between 183 and 230 million pounds divided between um, creditors. There's about a quarter of a million of them. Um, But that was in return for them dropping any potential legal action against Link. Um, So whilst it was primarily focused on Link there, this notice also fired a kind of warning shot again at Neil Woodford and Woodford Investment Management for their conduct in the management of the fund. Um, And, you know, to say that it might still take further action against them both. Um, That could take the form of fines, but we don't quite know yet. Um, And just in this notice, it's worth pointing out that the FCA found Mr Woodford had a defective and unreasonably narrow understanding of his responsibilities for managing liquidity risks. Now, lawyers for Mr. Woodford and Woodford Investment Management have hit back really strongly at this um, and the FCA, saying that actually the liquidity framework was the responsibility of LINK um, under supervision of the regulator itself. So kind of pretty strong message going back there. So given that he feels the findings are Um, in the lawyer's words, unprecedented and fundamentally misconceived. Um, I think this certainly won't be the last we hear on that inquiry side. And, you know, sadly, as we know, and you pointed out, many investors are still waiting for their redress. Yeah, I guess Neil Woodford, as as a fund manager, has been very quiet in the last couple of years um, for obvious reasons. And clearly, those sort of messages via the lawyer sort of fighting back, which suggests maybe he still sees a future as a fund manager. Um, be quite interesting to see if who who on earth would sort of want to back him if he did try and come out with any venture. But um, yeah, something something to keep our eye on there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So kind of going back to company news in recent days, um, Dan, there's been quite a bit. So what's actually caught your eye here? Yeah, I mean, there's there's three things that have caught my eye. Um, The first is it's actually a little tiny company. We wouldn't normally sort of look at the really small stuff, but it involves a brand I think lots of people will know. So, I mean, Charlene, when was the last time you went to TGI Fridays for a meal? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, gosh. Um, I'd probably say within the last 12 months, more for my kids than myself, though. I definitely sort of has a a place in my heart from when I was younger. But um, I have been because it's it's actually right outside my gym. Um, So you get the kind of smell of, you know, like ribs and fries and don't get me wrong. Um, that, that's pretty tempting when you don't have as much willpower as I've got. So yeah, <laughs> in the last 12 months, but I don't, if it wasn't there or it wasn't for the kids, maybe you'd probably be looking at about five years ago. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, 
I, I was, you know, I, I know the brand. I've never been there, I must confess. But um, to me, it's like the idea of, you know, if you, if you go back to sort of the 90s or the 80s, it was really popular then, but, you know, no one talks about it now. So we've got this this business called Hostmore, which is on the stock market. They, own the, the sort of, they have the rights to use that brand in the UK. But what they're doing now is buying the global master franchise owner. So essentially they get, um, it gives them a big stake in the US. And, and, and I thought it's a bit of a, you know, it's a real bold deal. They, they have to take on a considerable amount of debt for this. Um, and if you read the announcement, it, you know, they, they talk about all the all the benefits of um, what they can do at the moment under their current um, franchise uh, agreement. That there seems to be some restrictions. And of course, if they own the whole business, that they can get rid of those restrictions, do more things. But right, buried right at the bottom, there's a, like a trading update for the US arm. And, and it's, it's truly miserable. They're not having a good time. So, so that was announced. So this deal, we also had shares in Dr. Martin's fall by 30% in a day. Um, the company's still having loads of problems in America. So uh, it previously shipped too much stock too quickly. Um, and it saw real bottlenecks at a distribution center. Then it had problems getting the products to wholesale customers. The wholesale customers then became reluctant to hold large volumes of its footwear because they were worried about consumer weakness. It now says that wholesale orders still not very good in the US and it's got soaring costs. And of course, this is impacting the company's um, profits. And so th- this, this company, you know, whilst you know, the brand is really well known, uh, and I think that if you look at the sort of returns the company have made on their investments over the years, they've been very good. Ever since it's been a quoted company on the stock market, it's, it's done pretty miserably. Um, and just a third bit of news. This is just literally just come in as we we're recording this podcast. So um, the owner of Royal Mail um, International Distribution Services has received a takeover approach from the Czech billionaire Daniel Kretinsky. Um, so his vehicle is the EP Group. Um they own just over 27% of um, IDS or the Royal Mail owner um, so far. They want to buy the rest of it. And, and IDS has, has rejected it. We haven't seen any more information apart from that. But it's, it's really interesting how um, you know, this business clearly gone through a very difficult period, um, trying to introduce more automation, um, trying to make the whole business more efficient. But uh, you know, the, the, the posties are sort of been pushing back and, and they've had endless fights with the union. Last summer, they agreed a new pay deal, um, but it's still there's still loads of problems. And so EP Group put out a statement saying that they've made this approach, been rejected. Um, they think that the company needs to have a sort of a long term, uh, an owner sort of taking a long term view of it. And so, uh, yeah, interesting one to watch. Let's see where see where that one goes. Um, so let's bring on our, our first guest. Last week, we had... Someone from Fidelity talking about investing in Asia. So this week we're going to uh, sort of focus on opportunities in one of those sort of, uh, key countries in Asia, which is India, predicted to be one of the fastest growing uh, economies in the G20. And but we've got some upcoming elections, and I think this is sort of perhaps uh, raising lots of questions for investors. You're sort of wondering, you know, what you know, I, I could see potentially you know, why in, India might be interesting to look at, but. Um, how do I go about finding sort of well-run quality companies? And, and, and is, it, is the investment case good over the long term in India? So um, we dispatched Danny Hewson to talk to Aush Abhijit, the investment director of Ashoka India Equity Trust, about where he sees value in India and obviously some of these potential pitfalls. Uh, it's worth noting that Ashoka is, was one of the most popular investment trusts with AJBL customers in February too. So let's hear what Aush had to say to Danny. Um, so I suppose let's start with what many people see as the the bull case for India. No one's got any doubts that the country really has been performing incredibly well in terms of growth. So where do you see the potential for investors? A great question. Thank you, Tony, for having me on the show. Um, I guess if you take a step back, uh, the core thesis around investing in India is, is built on four key pillars of uh, a very strong once in an era transformation from an economic standpoint. Secondly, the quality of growth being uh, very strong because of co- because of domestic demand driving bulk of the growth. Uh, and there are two other slightly lesser known elements to, to the India story uh, one, the first one being that 
the corporate universe is very heterogeneous and very profitable, which stands out when you compare some of the other emerging markets. And the fourth element is around a very mature institutional infrastructure as far as the democratic institutions are concerned. So the first two factors around the economic evolution and, and domestically driven growth are very well understood and appreciated. But the third and fourth pillars are less so. With this broad construct, um, I think five areas where we, we see strong investment opportunities today are, one is in financial services, so the well-run private sector financials. Second is in consumer, both discretionary as well as staples. The third area, a lot of exciting opportunities in India currently would be healthcare, followed by technology services and industrials. It's interesting the way that you've listed them there. But one thing I did cotton on to is that you were talking about companies that are well run. How do you make sure that you are backing quality companies that are insulated from what could be regulatory changes on the horizon, which could limit growth? So one way to look at emerging market uh, economies is to is to look at the ownership of government uh, in equity markets or stock markets. So on average in emerging markets, 20% is owned by the government or 20% of the market is state-owned enterprises. In a country like China, that would be 30%. In India, that number is about 9%. What this tells you is that uh, government ownership and therefore government interference in, in capital allocation is far lower in India compared to most of the emerging markets. Then of all the segments that I described, there are few pockets where the risk of regulatory interference is higher, particularly uh, when you think about utilities, energy, oil and gas. These predominantly are, are the sectors where there is high risk of government interference. And within our portfolio, we tend to have lesser exposure to the segment of the market. You've obviously got boots on the ground. So you are going into these companies and really kicking the tires to make sure that you are happy with the management structure, with the outlook for the future, and with you know making sure that they're able to deal with those regulatory issues should they crop up. What are you doing to help investors make the right choices? At White Oak, we have a 45-member investment research team, uh, out of which 32 are India-dedicated uh, investment research analysts. Majority of them are based on the ground in India, and they conduct an extensive due diligence program of not only meeting companies at various levels of management, not only meeting competition, but doing an extensive due diligence of the entire ecosystem, which entails talking to suppliers, talking to distributors, visiting factories, interviewing ex-employees, former CFOs, conducting consumer surveys, talking to industry experts, talking to regulators. But the goal of building a holistic 360 degree view on the governance DNA of these companies, on their core competitive advantage, on their scalability attributes. And our goal is to understand these companies far better than anybody else in the peer group. And the best ones, companies that present a compelling combination of all of these attributes, along with them trading at a substantial discount to their intrinsic value, make it to the portfolio. So we don't subscribe to the buy at any price and hold on to it forever school of thought. Um, we want to buy businesses that present a very strong, compelling combination of both greatness of business as well as attractiveness of value. 
And both of these elements need to be in good measure for companies to make it into a portfolio. So you've got diversity in terms of the different sectors and size of companies. However, clearly, when we're talking about this fund, we're talking about just one geographic area, kind of putting all your eggs in one basket in some cases. Is is that a good idea? So I think when you think about global asset allocation, um, so Indian equities are part of the broader allocation that investors, you know, should be doing. Today, India's GDP market share is about 3.7% of global GDP. Um, growth share in global GDP is about 5%. And four or five years out, the share in global GDP is going to be more like 5%. And the contribution to global growth is going to be 8%. Just to put things in perspective, as far as the relevance of the country is concerned in a global setup, now investors may choose to have an allocation to India, depending on their comfort level and their risk appetite, somewhere around that ballpark. Three to five percent is what uh, typically investors might look at India in their portfolios. So definitely does not make sense for anybody to put 100% of their portfolio, especially global investors. But at the same time, uh, having met global investors uh, very frequently over the last few years, what we've come to realize is that most investors are under allocated to India today. In fact, most don't even have 1% of their portfolios allocated to India. So there's a sizable headroom uh, for, for that catch up to take place over the coming years. A lot of investors, um, when they've thought about investing in Asia, they went with China. Some of them have been burned. China certainly lost its way um, and didn't achieve the kind of growth levels. A lot of people thought it would be coming down the track once those zero COVID policies came to an end. Is there a risk that as that changes, that pulls some investors away from countries like India? I think that there's a slight um, uh, issue with that line of thought. And, and, and there is a misperception that global investors have, which is that Indian equity markets are benefiting from and exodus from China equity markets. If you And we've actually looked at a lot of numbers. And the conclusion is that it's not the case. And I'll explain why. When you think about capital coming into India from global investors, 80% of the capital actually comes as part of global emerging market funds. And only less than 20% comes as India dedicated funds. So, and then the global emerging market funds, the biggest exposure there is China. So global emerging market funds are getting sold off and as a result, every country gets sold off, including India. And India only funds is a very small part of the overall capital coming into India. So this is a very big misconception that India has benefited. Net, net, you'd be surprised. A lot of investors get shocked when they look at data that in the last two, two and a half years, net foreign flows into Indian equities is zero. Wow. So if you add up all the flows, it's zero because global emerging markets are getting sold off. India also is getting sold off. 80% of it is that. Only 20% of the capital is India only, which is getting inflows. Net, net, they cancel each other out. So far, India has not benefited at all from this perceived inflow of capital because of investors getting out of China. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, I I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the elections which are currently taking place in India, because that, for a lot of investors at the moment, there are big question marks because there are so many elections taking place. And clearly, the one in India could change the economic landscape. What are you watching? What are you concerned about? Consensus expectation is that the current uh, 
government will like live in the election um, and there is a very high probability of that uh, already being priced into equity markets today so the consensus is that modi is going to come to power for a third consecutive term and to that extent um, elections are being priced into the markets and not that much of a question mark especially uh, in the minds of people who've been looking at india very closely so there is a big likelihood of uh, a continuation of the reform agenda that the country has been witnessing perhaps what investors would closely watch is the gradient of change in this reform agenda right do we see acceleration of reforms uh, do we see further acceleration as far as growth is concerned do we see continuation of uh, taxation policies so and so forth so that's what the market is going to be watching out for the outcomes are more or less uh, are given and also being priced appropriately uh, into the market so to that extent it's not that important an election uh, in the indian context compared to the importance that one would have placed let's say 5 years ago or 10 years ago can i just end by asking you you went through some of the sectors that you're looking at closely is the one area that's really exciting you at the moment Very hard to call out one single area, but uh, particularly, um, you know, if you look at uh, private sector financials, uh, India has India has a large uh, opportunity as far as penetration of quality credit is concerned, and on top of that, well-run private sector financials have been gaining market share from the more inefficient public sector banks. so there is a multi decadal growth opportunity along with a market share gain vector at the same time this pocket as a whole has not done that well over the last 3 to 5 years even though loan books have grown even though profits have grown uh, we have seen some bit of a multiple compression in this segment which has made the valuations a lot more attractive for this high quality segment compared to what it was 5 years ago so that is one pocket i think where investors should watch out for because the valuations become quite attractive the other i would say is is within the industrial space particularly manufacturing related uh, opportunities so india has become the most credible alternative to uh, shifting supply chains outside of china period and as a result of that there are multiple companies that are Uh, benefiting from that relocation of supply chains within the industrial space uh, that is another exciting area i think that investors should watch out for of the next you know 5 to 10 years But, because this is going to be a multi decadal relocation uh, and india has global market share of you know 1 2% 3% depending on which category you look at compared to 20 to 40% for china so you can think of the uplift that can come in in, the, in in terms of the size of these manufacturing businesses even if there were to be 1 2 3 4% percent of market share movement uh, taking place over the next 3 to 5 years aish thank you so much for talking to us really appreciate your time from singapore thank you dani thank you for having me Thanks to Ayesha for coming on the show. So from Danny back to Dan and we're going to head back home and to UK stock market listings now. Um is the picture improving for IPOs here Dan? Um I know you've been looking at the performance of I think it's five companies that have listed in the UK this year and also what might be coming down the line. Yeah, I mean it's fair to say that IPO market generally is quiet. So those who don't know IPO stands for initial public offering and it's the first time someone gets a chance to buy shares in a company on stock market. So um what you need to think about here is that you've got quite a lot of companies being taken over. So we we need to fill you know replenish that pot 
uh, what's new coming onto the market. Um, over the years, you know, investors have been quite curious to see what's going on either it, because they like they like the idea there's something new for them to to research something you know, new opportunities. Sometimes it's companies that you've heard of, uh, but quite often it's companies you, you know, no one certainly not household names. Um, so of the five companies that are floated in the stock market in the UK this year, they've done very well. The average return is 16.4%. That compares to just 2.5% gain from the FTSE All Share Index. So the, 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 the top, top performer is Microsoft, which is um, a tiny little company, and it's it's trying to sort of, uh, sort of capitalize on... It's not perhaps a shift in consumer habits, people looking for healthier options. You know, we've had in recent years, you know, lower sugar products. Um, so here it's got sort of a low sodium salt. It's trying to sell to, to businesses and to um, direct to consumers. So we've got, obviously it's very early days in this business, but um, investors seem to like what it's doing so far. Share price is up just over 60%. Um, we've got a little tiny mining company called European Green Transitions up 24%. Um, there's Helix Exploration is up 10%. Um, and then just among the other couple, there's one that called Air Astana, which is um, a sort of Central Asian airline. BAE systems used to own a big chunk of it. Well, that's not done very well. That's down 15%. But I think overall, um, it's not bad, not really a bad performance at all. And of course, if you look at the US market, there's been some quite good names there. Is the one that really stands out is Solar Energy Equipment and LED Lighting Company, Solarmax Technology. Its share price doubled on the first day of trading. It's now up more than 260% since joining the market in, in February. So I think all of this sort of points to you know, little, little nuggets of positivity. And I think that's really important when you're looking at the UK market. The other thing I just wanted to point out was what I mentioned earlier about replenishing the pot where we're losing companies to taking takeovers. DS Smith is a FTSE 100 company, and it's kind of it's one of the big packaging names. Um, it's agreed a takeover offer with uh, International Paper. Well, th- this company, the, the suitor is a, a US listed one. So normally you think, okay, well, if it's an all share deal, that means if I own DS Smith shares now, I'm going to inherit US listed stock. But International Paper sort of said, actually, no, what we're going to do is we're going to have a secondary listing in London. That means that you know when the trade and the sort of takeover goes takeover goes through, we're going to have you know, the opportunity for you to essentially inherit UK listed shares. I think lots of investors might like that, and it's also another indication that the UK market is not completely broken, despite what lots of people are saying. Um, and I wonder whether if we get more situations like this, foreign companies taking over UK ones, maybe others will do the same sort of stuff. Now, I know we're on a bit of a feel-good uh, role t- <laughs> today. Um, so just to bring the mood down a little bit, um, what about the companies that are leaving or rumoured to be thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, the, the headlines this last week have been full of talk that Shell is really grumpy. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, as an oil and gas company can be as grumpy. Um, it's essentially saying that, you know, their, their valuation is a lot lower than companies in the US who do the same thing. And it's the same same thing, same situation for BP. And the reason is that US firms are very open by saying, we're going to exploit fossil fuels. Um, yeah, we've got some interest in renewable energy, but it's nothing like this sort of, um, sort of the, the, the energy transition that we see with, with when you talk to Shell, or BP, or even some of the uh, European names. US firms basically say, we do oil and gas, and that's what we continue to do. Um, so, and you know, the market seems to give them a higher rating. So Shell thinks if it moves to the US market, it will get higher rating. Let, 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 you know, it's all speculation at the moment. So if you own Shell shares, uh, you don't have to worry at the moment about, oh my God, what's going to happen? Is, you know, I'm going to get US listed stock. The other one is that there's an active investor calling on Wood Group, which is um, engineering and sort of oil services um, sort of business to, to consider US listing as well. So, I mean, this, this is all talk at the moment. There's nothing, nothing concrete here. So let's, let's move on to uh, another topic. And let's talk about scams. This is quite important because there seems to be a lot more activity, uh, which is not good. I think it's really important that people are aware about what's happening and what they can do to to not fall foul of these scams. So um, there's a really interesting one, which is involving Taylor Swift. And I certainly see this a lot. Looking at Facebook, I keep seeing these posts, people saying, I've got four tickets 
uh, available for Taylor Swift. I can't go anymore. Does anyone want them um, or want to buy them? And it's like on a daily basis, I'm seeing this across so many different Facebook pages and they all seem to be a scam. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And where it used to sort of be like trusted word of mouth, you'd kind of find a friend that might have some tickets. Um, Like you say, it just seems to be really widespread. And one of these stories that we've seen um, today, actually, is from Lloyds Bank that estimates more than a million pounds could have already been lost in the UK. So fraudsters pretending to offer Taylor Swift concert tickets. Um, So they've issued a warning to fans about these so-called purchase scams. So where people are tricked into sending money to buy um, goods, or in this case, um, tickets that are fake, um, defective, or just don't exist. So there's often kind of two waves with this type of fraud. So the first when tickets go on sale, you know, much hype tickets are released. And then the second, around the time an event takes place. Um, So lawyers have looked um, at the kind of purchase scams that have been reported by their customers. So Lloyds Bank, Halifax and Bank of Scotland here, all within that kind of Lloyds banking group, um, where Swift or the Aeros tour um, were referenced as part of the claim. So between July last year and March this year, now I must say I'm not a Swifty, so sorry if I uh, pronounce that tour name um, wrong, but on a serious note, you know, more, 600, uh, more than 600 of their customers have come forward so far to report being scammed and the average amount lost by each victim was 332 pounds in some cases more than a thousand pounds so um you know in terms of of tickets here it's it's really really um sad figures to come out um and lloyds have used this data to kind of estimate across other banks that there must have been at least three thousand victims since these tickets went on sale um equating to that more than one million pound figure being lost to fraudsters um, so really something to be aware of, you know, if you've got family members um, and, and you know, th- these gigs are so, so popular and huge, huge tours, um, just something to kind of really be aware of there. Um, and away from kind of purchase scams and onto investments, um, another piece of data we saw was from Barclays that indicated people falling prey to investment scams. Um, are losing on on average fourteen thousand pounds, and uh, only today I've had another email from my bank warning me about scams and pushy techniques, and in particular um, cryptocurrency scams. So, um, Dan, what else have you seen this week, and what can people do to protect themselves when it comes to investments? Yeah, I think I mean on the Taylor Swift thing, I've seen um, you're right in saying there's sort of two waves of it. I've seen when those when these tickets for these big concerts or uh, tours go on sale. You know, they, they quite often give it like a pre-sale where you can, you know, if certain people give you get qualify for a code and you can you can sign up. I noticed if you go on Twitter, literally within two seconds of it going on sale, you suddenly get all these messages, people saying, oh, I bought tickets, but I can no longer go. You know that these are totally going to be a scam, these people. And the other thing is when I'm on Facebook and I see people offering these face, uh, these sort of tickets for the Taylor Swift um, tour, if you click on their account, they typically have only just joined, say, joined a certain group where you're yeah. seeing this message on that day or in the last week. And that's got to be another red flag as well. Um, on the investment scams, um, the Barclays report into it. So what they're saying is that they're actually seeing a um, common trick is to encourage people to invest a small amount of money at the start. And actually people are getting they're getting some returns because what the scammers are doing, that they're, they're essentially taking cash that they've conned from other people um, and convincing essentially this new victim that the investment is legitimate. So that, I mean, so normally what you think, okay, well, someone's offering something, um, I sign up for it, and, and if I never hear back, clearly I've lost my money. But here, that they're, they're trying to convince you that this is real. Uh, and what happens is that they then try and lure you into um, investing more money and, and, and then you're losing this large amount. So um, they're sort of... You have to sort of think, okay, if if something, if you're being urged to do something and there's a, a, a sort of a false sense of urgency, you must do this now. You've only got a limited time to get this offer. You, you know, you have to think, okay, is this too good to be true? Why am I being rushed to do this? Um, you, you, you know, really be wary of taking any investment recommendations from um, someone you don't know or, uh, without doing research. Um, you, you know, check to see if a person or an organization who's contacting you is authorized by the Financial Conduct Authority to, to, to offer sort of a financial service. And, you know, or, or you can go on and check the FCA's Scam Smart 
um, investment tracker. So just be really careful. And the other thing to point out is, unfortunately, these people are using more sophisticated technology. So we're now hearing about um, using AI uh, and sort of pretend or, or, or videos where they sort of they spoof people's voices to answer security questions. Um, and, and I think that, you know, sometimes they're, they're sort of using AI to create fake versions of, um, say, friends or family, personating your colleagues and work communication. So you, you do need to be really careful. And, and perhaps one way to do it is to, you know, if, if someone you think you, you is getting, it's got contacting you, you think you know them is to perhaps ask them uh, you know, to verify an identity somehow, or, or is there a code word that you know that it, between friends that you can, to check that they are uh, getting involved. So yeah, do, do, do be very, very careful out there. So just to finish up, Charlene's been looking at all things to do with gift aid and charity donations. Now, with an estimated £500 million a year going unclaimed in gift aid and tax relief for people making donations, how can you actually give a welcome donation to your favourite charity and potentially save some tax too? Yeah, so despite the kind of cost of living crisis that we we talk about, um, that hasn't actually dented the generosity um, of people in terms of charity donations. Um, As in Britain, almost £14 billion was donated to charity last year, and that was £1.2 billion up um, on the previous year. Um, So kind of to be sure you're not missing out on some of the tax perks and, you know, your share of that £500 million that Dan mentioned, um, it's worth kind of having a check about gift aid. So gift aid is a tax incentive that gives a top up on the donations um, that UK taxpayers make to UK registered charities or community amateur sports clubs. So the way gift aid works is that the government will top up that charity donation by 25%. So that's equivalent to um, the basic rate tax um, that would have been paid on the money donated. So using an example, um, if I donated £100 um, to charity, the government will top that up by £25, meaning the charity actually gets £125. Um, But as well as that gift aid, um, higher and additional rate taxpayers can actually claim some tax relief back. Um, So it will be 20% or 25% depending on what bracket you fall into. Um, So again, just to use a kind of another um, example here, um, I've looked at the uh, average donation in the UK giving report, um, which was £780 a year. So I think it takes a a monthly amount and and extrapolates that over the year. So um, a higher rate taxpayer who pays that average amount of uh, £780 for the year, um, that would be topped up by gift aid, meaning the charity gets £975. But that taxpayer can then claim back £195 in tax relief um, from HMRC, either via self-assessment or by contacting them directly. So the charity receives £975, but it costs the taxpayer £585. Now, of course, the figures will be slightly different for Scottish taxpayers, and there is no rebate for basic rate taxpayers. This is um, something for higher and additional rate taxpayers. Now, HMRC's own research, although it is a few years old now, um, showed that although 94% of higher earners who donate to charity have heard about gift aid, <clears throat> only uh, 52%, only half, were aware they could actually claim a tax rebate on their donations themselves. And um, it was just one in five higher and additional rate taxpayers had actually claimed a rebate, which goes some way to kind of explain that estimated five hundred million pound shortfall in the value of unclaimed gift aid and tax relief there. And obviously, as we know very well with frozen tax bans and allowances, more and more people are getting dragged into paying high rates of tax. Um, so it's likely that that unclaimed gift aid and tax relief figure is, is far higher than than that five hundred million pounds even suggests. Um, I think like, a good handy tip that some people aren't always aware of is that you can also claim um, a rebate or your tax relief in year. So obviously, I mentioned you can claim via self assessment, and normally tax returns look back over payments and your expenses for the previous tax year. But gift aid rules mean um, you can actually claim a rebate for donations made in the current year too up until the date you file your tax return, meaning you could actually get your gift aid rebate a bit sooner. Um, And just another thing to point out, you know, you can avoid uh, one of the many tax traps perhaps in our tax system. Um, So for instance, you might be a parent who's gone over the high income child benefit charge threshold at which you start to use child benefit or your earnings 
um, have reached that £100,000 limit where you start to lose your tax-free personal allowance, you know, having that, that kind of whopping 60% tax rate on a slice of your earnings. So by making a charity donation um, and claiming gift aid, that full value of that donation, so what you pay plus that government gift aid top up, will be deducted from your income that's used against um, either of those limits. So it's a very similar tax planning outcome that um, you, you'd get from making a pension contribution towards your retirement as well. So just take that kind of gross value of that charity donation off of your, your taxable income um, for those limits and those thresholds and those tests, and you might find you actually get some tax back or some personal allowance back. Um, if you think you've missed out on a rebate, having listened to this, um, if you've got records of your donations, obviously really important to keep those records, whether it's electronic or otherwise, um, you can actually make claims going back to up to four years. So um, to do this, you can contact HMRC um, via the, the, the web chat that they like to push, um, or if you're lucky enough to get through on the phone lines. Yeah, lucky enough to get through on the phone yeah. lines. Uh, let's be realistic. That's going to be um, hard to do, isn't it? So. Um, well, thanks very much, Charlene. So I think that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you for tuning in to the Age of Bell Money Markets podcast. Don't forget to tune in again next week, where we're going to have a deep dive into Associated British Foods, best known as the owner of Primark. And it'd be great if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Until next time, thank you very much for listening. Before you go, please remember this podcast is for educational purposes. And the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of AJ Bell or Shares magazine. The podcast isn't telling you if a certain investment is suitable or not. Don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it. It's also important to remember that how you're taxed will depend on your individual circumstances and rules can change. The way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor.